All right, let's see what questions we have. Someone's asking about, did I suffer from imposter syndrome earlier in my career? Um, I'm going to treat that, maybe we come back to that because that seems a little bit off topic to me. Uh, the short answer is no, but um, <laughs> I have other thoughts about that, but they become increasingly off topic. So I'd prefer not to do that if we don't need to. Do I have any specific recommendations for making a habit out of these techniques? You know, I never practiced them, and I'm not really a technique practicer. Um, so for me, it was just about when something bugs me in the middle of the day, naturally, like whatever happens in life, then I remembered to bring one of these into play. And that was all that I needed to make the amount of progress that I have, which is not to say that my amount of progress is exemplary or anything. Um, certainly... Well, who knows? Who knows what could happen if I had diligently practiced these every day for an hour or something? But that's not what I did. Not at all. Someone is asking, when you check your physical sensations or emotional feelings, do you describe them in your mind with literal terms, or is it more about trying to see it as it is? Something that is almost indescribable by language. Yes, you don't want to engage language when you're doing this. That would be a mistake because then you're looking at your thoughts and not really looking at the actual sensation. So for example, the exercise when I'm just sitting here and I'm feeling my body on the chair and where those two things meet, I don't want to verbalize to myself at all. I just want to see what it feels like. I want to perceive directly what it feels like without mediating with an explanation because the explanation is going to be inaccurate and it'll draw your attention to the explanation rather than the sensation. And what we're trying to gain is experience looking at the actual sensation. As someone who values their intelligence a lot, I believe my thoughts to be very important because golly, I'm a smart person. I should trust what I think. But the idea that thoughts are a small portion of the human experience isn't something I considered. Basically, thank you. Okay, well, there's lots more to consider. I mean, if I'd wanted this to be an eight-hour thing, it could have been, right? Um, so another thing to consider, if your thoughts are so important, um, do you choose your thoughts? Do you decide to think any specific thought? Or does it just come out, right? Um, if you decide, <laughs> when do you decide to decide to have that thought, right? Um, or when you're talking to someone, does the next sentence just kind of come out? You know, there are, this is a little bit of a weird thing because there are certain people who premeditate what they're going to say in their mind before they say it. Those people tend to be a little bit on the autism spectrum or a little bit very concerned with self-image and wanting to filter everything they say. But then in that case, if you think what you're going to say before you say it, how did you decide that exact sentence that you thought you were going to say. It's not like you opened up a big menu of words and picked this word and then that word and then that word. No, somehow, somehow that thought came to you, right? And so one of the things, one of the very valuable insights that you get when you watch your own stream of thoughts like this is that the thoughts essentially come from outside, right? <laughs> They're, they come from outside your awareness into your awareness. And, you can't particularly say that you, the conscious decision maker, chose to think that particular thought. You might have some model about your unconscious mind generating the thought, but you don't really have control over your unconscious mind. So, yeah. Uh, which is not to denigrate intelligence in any way. I think intelligence is super important. Uh, I, I think a lot of us here are programmers or other technical people, and um, you really need intelligence to do that kind of work. Um, but it is helpful to look at intelligence more closely. So someone says, I find you are not your thoughts to be absurd personally and highly confusing. I have trouble understanding what that actually means. What am I then? Well, um, like I said, there's all this experience around you. Um, 
And part of that exercise that I was trying to do early on was to pay attention to this stuff around you. Well, let's do this. So you look, just look at the room or whatever. Just have a relaxed attention. And just for a second, don't think, don't think anything. Just stop your thoughts. And do that for as long as possible, all right? So three, two, one, go. And if you fail and think something, just try again. Just try stopping your thoughts. You don't have to try this for very long. Um, even if you flubbed and thought something very quickly, right? There was a time before that thought happened when you were still perceiving these things around you. You still existed. You weren't thinking a specific thing, but you still existed and you still were perceiving. And the things you were perceiving informed where your mind went afterward, right? So if you were looking, <laughs> if you were looking around at the room, so a thing that I, I thought that I had earlier was I should have taken care of that box, right? Um, if I am my thoughts, <laughs> then where did, where did the thought about the box come from? It had to come from some conscious perception of the box, or maybe not even conscious, but I had to see the box and process the fact that it was there in some way to have a thought about the box. So obviously, there's a big part of me that is prior to thought, that happens before the thought happens. And if you have difficulty stopping your thought uh, or not thinking something, you can try stopping a sentence in the middle. So I'm going to think the fact, oh, I should have taken care of that box, and I'm going to stop before the word box and try to force myself not to continue that sentence for as long as possible. And by doing that, to whatever degree that you're successful, you can see that there's an effort, right? You can see there's some kind of trying not to let the thought proceed, right? If you can see some kind of trying not to let the thought proceed and then either succeeding or failing and the thought keeps going, then it's clear that you're like outside your thoughts looking at them, right? If you're your thoughts, then how are you seeing your thoughts? Like what, what, what is looking at your thought if you're your thought, right? How would that make any sense? Like I said, it's weird. Some people have no problem whatsoever understanding this. Other people find it so alien that they don't know what, what to do. So all I can recommend is you just keep trying these things, right? For even if it was only 100 milliseconds that you managed not to think a thought while looking, and you feel like, oh, I failed because I could only not think for 100 milliseconds, did you disappear during that 100 milliseconds? Somehow, did you cease to exist, or were you seeing the room before the thought came in? Has finding artistic success brought you any peace? Has your approach changed from before the games? It's brought me some amount of peace, but it, not really the deepest peace. So the, the deep peace that people really want doesn't usually come from, it doesn't come from what people typically consider to be success, right? And you know that, like, that's where the whole money doesn't buy happiness thing comes from. And that's why you see Hollywood stars at the top of their league kill themselves, right? I mean, sometimes it's due to mental diseases, right? But often, well, how you, how you want to classify things is like a whole thing, but often people become, let's not even talk about the killing oneself case, just often people in that kind of position are chronically unhappy, even though they've done everything that they would have told you five years ago they meant to do, right? So for me, I definitely find fulfillment in the things that I do. Um, and it makes me happy often, but um, I think the actual deeper happiness can be related to artistic work, but it's what happens 
while you're actively doing the thing that you're most happy with. I don't think it comes from having done it in the past. It doesn't come from thinking about how people have, for me at least, it certainly doesn't come from thinking about how people might have appreciated what I did or whatever. It's more of the serenity of actively performing something that you know is good right now in this second. That is one of the best feelings that I know. And that, that can come whether other people acknowledge how good your thing was or not. You know, if you know that what you're doing is good, um, it's a very special feeling. Have I been to meditation retreats? Yes. In the example of being distracted due to a physical discomfort, the solution there to address what's causing, is the solution there to address what's causing the discomfort or does it become ignorable by shining the flashlight on it, so to speak? Um, well, <clears throat> it could be both depending on your personal situation. Uh, the, the case that I was going into, which is very simple and which is, I think, a universal experience is to look at, just look at the sensation that underlies your interpretation of what your body feels, right? And that anyone can do. Um, beyond that, though, there might be reasons for certain sensations, you know? If I'm, if I'm feeling into my chest and I'm chronically, like, hunched because I'm unhappy and uh, whatever, um, you might think that the sensations in your chest are being caused by the physical activity of hunching, and that'll be going on, but there's also like, well, actually, your propensity to hunch is happening because of certain sensations in your body, and those things have causes and a history, right? And so you could attempt to address those if you think they're there for a reason that needs addressing in some particular cases. I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, that's not something that I've even done super much. I haven't needed to do that, but I know that that's a thing that some people do. Uh, but for me, a large amount of benefit just comes from observing sensations neutrally without needing to do any kind of further manipulation exercise on them. Do I have any tips for thriving in a world, country, or era where it seems like so many things are going wrong? How do you stand back from wanting to help change or improve everything? How do you counteract the feeling of selfishness? You choose to focus on yourself first. So here's the thing. It's very easy in this day where people on the internet are telling you what they think about everything all the time. It's very easy to feel like lots of stuff is going wrong and everything is bad because all this news comes in about bad things. And there are bad things, certainly. There are bad things happening. However, there is a fine art to recognizing what really needs addressing versus what really is a conjuring of your own mind, right? And, you know, what you'll find in all this news of what's going on in the world, you know, most of it is inaccurate to some degree or another. Like things about who is doing what in the US government and why is probably mostly made up actually. Uh, or, um, you know, whatever, like what, I mean, there are real world geopolitical problems happening, but if you really knew the full truth of them, they wouldn't quite look like, like what, what you think, right? So certainly the U.S. has problems with North Korea right now, right? And you can learn the vague parameters of those things, but I think if you were an expert on the subject, then your understanding of it would be very different from what a random person on Facebook 
understands, right? And so the random person on, who gets their news from Facebook, their emotional venting on North Korea vis-a-vis -vis the USA is probably not that helpful, right? It's based on ignorance. So, so then if that's you, do you really want to be that? Do you really want to devote most of your energy to things that people are telling you, to mythical situations that people are telling you how they're a certain way, or do you want to spend your energy on things that you actually know something about and can do something about? And so I choose the latter, right? And the way these techniques can dovetail into that is you can just, after a while you learn when you're projecting something versus when you're authentically experiencing something. And so I turn my attention towards things that I'm really experiencing and put my effort there. And that doesn't preclude helping out with things, right? So when these hurricanes hit Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico, you know, I made donations to the relief funds. Um, you know, I didn't say, oh, those are far away things that have nothing to do with me, right? But that's just because making a donation to those relief funds um, seemed very probably like it would actually help people in reality to some degree or another, right? What I don't know anything about whether it would help people is to get mad about whether Trump did or did not send something in time or anything like that. Because none of that, I don't know anything about any of that stuff and neither do you guys, right? Um, so I, I choose, well, I'm trying to develop the habit of choosing to provide mental energy and physical action when that's appropriate toward things that, that I am sure are real or that have a higher probability of being real. And, you know, it's up to you how you want to do that. It's just a recommendation. Will I say hi for Chris, to Chris Hecker for you next time I see him? I don't know who you are, Elvis Snake, so... I could say that, but it wouldn't be meaningful to me. How to go back from neutral state to the emotional one. Uh, your emotions are dogged, most likely, and they will have no problem coming back. Don't be worried about like, oh my God, I'm going to turn myself into Spock or something. That's not going to happen because your emotions will rise up again at the slightest provocation. Don't worry. I said I was at a retreat earlier. Was it something specific like mindfulness or Buddhism? If so, how do you feel these things influence your thinking? I've been to a bunch of retreats about a bunch of different things. Um, the stuff that I was talking about today, which I feel is the most useful thing to communicate on these subjects, uh, doesn't exactly fit into Buddhism or mindfulness or anything, although both of those practices are heavily related like they both do things that dovetail directly into this and the skill sets cross over and all that um, I mean maybe what I said fits I mean it sort of fits into both but it would be a very specific subset of either of those things right like Buddhism is a very large thing and a lot of it I think is unhelpful to modern people um, and yeah I, I am not a Buddhist, for example. I'll say that. Interesting that I didn't mention meditation for people who like the exercises and want to go further on the thoughts front. Well, I feel like people have heard of meditation. <laughs> I don't need to tell people that there's a thing called meditation that exists. Um, so I, I'm not doing that. I, I felt more uh, inclined to share these specific techniques. Wow, I might miss, um, I'm at the top of the chat and it's scrolling off the top and I'm answering questions there. So I may, I may miss questions. I'm sorry about that. Do I think games as a medium are inherently better able to explore this interior exterior relationship? And I missed the rest of the question, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, 
Maybe, but it's hard to say how. Maybe the rest of the question would have helped me answer in more detail. Um, not a question, but just want to say thank you. I've been in a funk recently, and this definitely helped. It will help, and it will help so much, especially um, just the permission to sit there and feel your bodily sensations, because in a funk implies that there are bodily sensations happening. You might be more thinking of the emotional state or even the thoughts, but the bodily sensations are there. And if you just, if you look at them, it'll help. It'll really help. Could I talk a little bit about my experience with Zen meditation as opposed to mindfulness meditation? Do I see them as two sides of the same coin or, and this question scrolled off. I have never done Zen meditation. So I've never done Zazen. I've never, you know, I've never gone to a Zen monastery and spent time there as a monk. Um, so I can't tell you anything about that. I've done various other forms of meditation and I have, I have some favorites. Um, but it really, I mean, I think going into those in detail would be a thing for another time. Uh, I, <laughs> it, would, it would take hours. I mean, if you're interested in meditation, then go ahead and explore it. And all I would have to say there is be wary of anybody who wants money from you in order to teach meditation. Or certainly, you know, m more than renting the room that it takes to tell you something, right? If somebody wants thousands of dollars to teach you meditation, be wary of that. And... Um, be wary of people who want too much attention. Like if you sense some kind of guru worship situation, just get away from that because that's not, why does that help anybody? What is, what is you know, worshiping some guru have to do with the truth of daily reality as we experience it? Those are very different things. And so there are all these traps set up out in the world for people who, are interested in meditation. So avoid those, <laughs> but see what's out there and, and see what you cotton to. Which of the three elements do you think is more prominent when feeling empty, undecided, when deciding what to do after a long project? I'm having a hard time being confident in setting a new long-term goal. Well, so instead of focusing on any one of those categories, once you have practice at, or if it came naturally to you, at, at tuning your attention to any of those, um, you can then uh, it's a slightly a meta skill, but you can then just sit back in an observational inquiry way and say, what's happening for me right now? Are thoughts happening? Are emotional states happening? Are bodily sensations happening? Um, what is going on? And then, and then you can see what's going on and, and it's a good chance that whatever is going on right now is, is helping to create whatever negative or uncertain state that you're having right now. And being uncertain about what you want to do is not bad. Like maybe you just don't know. Maybe you have to be okay with not knowing for a while too. That's a thing for sure. Uh, when did I start doing these things and how quickly did it affect my work and motivation? Um, I would say probably I started with these specific kinds of things around 2010 or 2011. And they probably started affecting me immediately, as in the second I was doing them. Um, and the large changes that I saw, like those anecdotes that I told you about, you know, certain observations that I made of my own, um, those happened within six months to a year. It really didn't take long. Of course, this is ongoing, and I notice things that help me all the time, but really big observations were not long in coming. Um, and so, you know, when I talk about, like, I used to have depressive tendencies, and I don't anymore, that change 
the bulk of that change happened um, 2010 to 2011, I would say. Maybe a little bit 2012. So a couple years after I learned these things, at most, at most. Gaming is, at its essence, a consensual hallucination. Can gaming be a form of meditation? Maybe. Um, maybe not, though, because games are about focusing your attention on something. And when meditations are about focusing your attention on something, they're, that's usually called concentration meditation. And the ultimate aim of concentration meditation is not necessarily the thing you're concentrating on. It's to keep your mind from concentrating on other things. So I think you could use a game to do that, but I don't necessarily know that that's any better than any other kind of concentration meditation. I don't know. It would be a field you could explore. Someone says, I feel like I've neutralized my emotions, sensations a bit too much in my life. I've had people describe me as cold. Uh, the rest of the question scrolled off. Let me try to answer what of that question that I saw, um, which is to start by saying this is not, the, the exercises that I talked about today are not about neutralizing emotions in the sense of suppressing them. You don't want to do that, right? They're actually the opposite. They're actually, if you feel something very negative that's helping cause recurring bad states for you, then, you know, maybe, maybe part of what is causing those bad states is the repression of that negative feeling. It's like you don't want to feel that feeling fully or you're worried about it or you just feel the need to quarantine it, right? And so that creates uh, some of these negative amplifications um, and tensions in the body. Uh, and in reactions and in habits and all that. And so this is the opposite of suppressing those emotions. This is, or suppressing those feelings, this is feel the feelings. Like maybe, maybe when you were a little kid, you ha didn't know how to deal with something, so you had to repress it. But now if you're an adult, you're in a safe space, maybe it's okay to feel that thing. And, and part of what you're doing is just by observing it, you're obviously allowing yourself to feel it. And sometimes that loosens some things. That's not the primary objective of what I was talking about today. The primary objective was just showing you what it's like just to observe these things. But as a side effect of observing these things, you can loosen things up. So I actually also would have described myself as repressing my emotions a fair bit when I was much younger like, you know, in my teens and 20s and stuff like that. Uh, that is very different from what I'm recommending here, and I hope that there's no confusion about that. So when I say, when I say that an emotion, an emotional state will dissipate when you look directly at it, that's not because you're pushing it away. It's because you're seeing how it really is, or to what degree it really is a substantial thing. And those are very different, and maybe I should just stop, stop talking about it and recommend that you just try it and see what it's like experientially. Would I call the observation of thoughts and perception of feelings I'm talking about meditation? Maybe. I mean... People use the word meditation to mean all kinds of things, and um, I would say these are related to meditation, but I would actually call them contemplations or exercises, um, which you can do in a mildly meditative frame of mind, but they're not themselves meditation. But a lot of people would disagree with that and would use the word meditation to describe this kind of thing. How have these habits affected your relationship with positive experience and emotions? Um, well, it means that when you have positive emotions, you don't take them as seriously. You can still enjoy them, totally. Like, 
I'm not recommending that you uh, try to sabotage your positive emotions because they don't trap you, right? We don't feel trapped in positive emotions the way we feel trapped in negative emotions. So we don't need to address them the same way. Uh, and positive emotions tend not to last as long, right? If we have a lot of positivity, we tend to get used to that after a while, or it tends to play itself out, whereas negativity can recur for much longer periods. So, you know, that's why I say that these address negativity, but of course, they're applicable to positive feelings in the same way. And what does that mean? Well, maybe it means that you don't you don't form your identity so heavily on being someone who needs to feel positive things all the time because you know that while positive feelings are nice they're also insubstantial just like negative feelings are and so the, there's something experientially that happens where you realize they're not as important but they're nice they're nice when they happen and it's good to enjoy things i think so i'm not discouraging that A lot of people who use mind-altering substances on a regular basis, tobacco, alcohol, weed, LSD, etc., report the end result being similar or identical to the neutral and detached mindset that you describe in your talk. Notwithstanding the well-known negative effects of those on a person, do you agree that they can put you in a similar mindset to the one you achieved through the use of these techniques? Well, I don't have that much experience with drugs relative to the kinds of people who make these kinds of statements. Um, I do have some experience with some drugs way in the past, and I would say that they, for me, they did not help me get into this kind of state at all. Um, for I don't want to get too specific about illegal activities, but um, you know, I, one of these substances that many people re, uh, report gives them a, a feeling of being expansive and fulfilled and, and being able to see things from a higher perspective, uh, to me, just put me in a hyper-rational. It was actually, it was simultaneously a hyper-rational and irrational state. Like I was like nonstop hyper-chain thinking about a bunch of things, but the things didn't make any logical sense, but they seemed in the moment like they made logical sense. It was a very different place. So um, I never got to any place like that in the small number of illegal or quasi-legal experiences that I had. But, you know, if that works for other people, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny them that. Someone says, what makes me unhappy the most and how do I fight with it? Well, um, I'm not unhappy that much these days. Uh, there is, you know, running a game company and trying to get things done on deadlines is a little bit stressful, and then feeling like I didn't do as good of a job as I should have on certain things uh, makes me feel negative, uh, but not nearly as much as I did some years ago. Even, even a few years ago when we were in the middle of working on The Witness, and I was still susceptible at that time to getting stressed out, uh, you know, there was a month or two in the middle of that development when I was really uh, in a pretty bad emotional state for a lot of the time. But, but even so, it was not nearly as bad as what it would have been had I not been practicing observation of my own psychology. Being self-aware of what is going on with you is tremendously useful. So... Uh, you know, to this day, I would say that those are the biggest things. Um, I also have stuff, like I'm single right now. I've been single for a long time. So I have that kind of feeling like, oh, I wish I was in a relationship with someone or something. But again, um, whereas going into the distant past, like a decade or two ago, if I had that kind of a feeling, um, it would be it would feel much more oppressive and unbearable. It would be like, oh my God, my identity is that I'm supposed to be with somebody and I'm a failure at that right now and blah, 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 right? All these things that we can get into, whereas now I'm just not that susceptible to that kind of thought, right? Um, it's just more like, well, you know, 
I might like it if I was <laughs> if I was in a good relationship that I was happy with, but I feel like a complete person without that, right? So those are some ex those are examples for me, but everybody is different and other people have different examples. So this approach, as I understood it, is about making negative interpretations of reality neutral. Not exactly, not exactly. Uh, but have you tried anything about consciously making positive events in life happen to not only mitigate the negative, but add positivity? No. And that's because it, it sounds a little bit paradoxical, but the things that I talked about are not really about getting rid of negativity. They're about seeing things as they really are. And a beneficial side effect of seeing things as they really are is that we get less trapped in negativity because negativity is not what we think it is, right? And so I'm giving these things as a recommendation where if you have frequent negative experiences, these things may help you deal with those experiences or stop them from recurring so much, right? Um, but the technique in the moment when you're practicing these things is not about trying to get rid of anything. Because if you, if you try to get rid of things, you're not really in the right mindset, right? This is a, a mindset of investigating what is really true. And then you hope that seeing what is really true internally to you may help you out. <laughs> but don't believe me about this, right? Don't believe me about what the effects will be. Don't believe me about what you'll see if you look internally. This is all supposed to be you look internally and you see whatever you see. It's not about forcing things to be positive or negative. And I, I really don't recommend that. That's a bad road to go down. Someone says Team Zazen. Um, how do you usually judge if you're actually tired or just trying to avoid the task at hand? How do you manage rest, leisure, sleep versus work and being able to do a lot of things? Well, um, I have a mild depressive feeling that doesn't bother me very much anymore, but I'm very familiar with it and it feels like being tired, but it's different from a straight up physical tiredness. And I don't know how to explain it because it's a personal feeling to me, but it feels different. And by feeling the two things separately, um, I just know the difference after all this time, right? Uh, and knowing the difference is very helpful to me. But ironically, both are helped if I take a nap, right? If I feel this mildly depressive kind of tiredness, um, usually that's an amplification on some kind of maybe subtle feeling of genuine tiredness often. And a nap helps. Uh, but then also it helps to know that it's not as bad as I think it is. Do I get lonely since I don't work in my company's office most of the time? Not really. Um, I don't actually go to lunch with people in the office and stuff like that. Um, I, don't, I don't use the office for personal connection. I like go out and do social things for personal connection. Have I ever studied any of the pragmatic esoteric teachings or modern versions like the Robert Anton Wilson, Chris Hyatt? Um, if by esoteric teachings you mean occult stuff, I don't find that to be a very productive direction. It's never been very appealing to me though. Um, I do think there are teachings that are very old in the world from which you can, ex can extract very valuable lessons, but um, I don't necessarily find that to be the best direction, but maybe it is for certain people. Who knows? Um, am I familiar with Stoicism at all? Only mildly. Uh, do I think there is value in viewing all things as neutral, even the positive? Um, I can't say much about what Stoicism actually is like in day-to-day -day life, and I think 
many people don't even know because the modern interpretation of the word stoic to my understanding is not really what stoicism was actually about uh, but i can't say much about it because uh, you know i i don't know much about that tradition actually have i experienced being chronically mentally tired do I treat that just as an emotional condition? Um, I have had some times when I was chronically mentally tired. Sometimes it was because I overworked myself for a long time in succession. But often also it was because I was eating too much sugar, honestly. Um, I found that personally eating a lot of sugar while thinking a lot interferes with my ability to think. So that may not be true for everybody, but it may be true for you, so be careful there. Someone says, I'm not sure how this helps me to stay motivated. I'm sure it helps to be not motivated. Well, I think you mean not to be not motivated, but is this enough? Well, let me say the following thing. In my experience, when I am content with what I'm doing and happy, there is a natural energy that bubbles up and gives me, or a natural feeling or mindset that bubbles up and gives me the energy to do things, right? And I don't have to try and make it happen. When I'm in the right conditions, it happens and it naturally powers me, right? And so if you're stuck in unwarranted negativity, you're preventing that from happening. So by removing these unproductive times from your life, then maybe you're making more space for the fountains of creativity to come to you. That's the way it works for me. Um, now, there are other ingredients to that, but I think maybe different people's creativity is different as well. So I don't want to prescribe too much there. Wow, is my camera super blue? I need a better camera, man. Camera's blurry. Have I ever tried applying these techniques directly to competitive gaming and seen positive results acting as an esports gamer? I'm not an esports gamer. I can't say anything about that. Oh, scrolling way down the chat. Scrolling way down the chat. We might, uh, I don't know, let's see how many questions are. <laughs> Funny comments. Someone says, do I believe in God? Um, I don't know. It depends on what you mean by that. Uh, I don't believe in an Abrahamic analog of a man in the sky who judges you based on your deeds and punishes you forever if you do the wrong thing. I don't believe in that. Um, but also modernly when people say that they're atheists, uh, that actually carries a lot of connotations. Like, like that means they're materialists and they believe that there's no creative force involved in the world and all that. And I don't believe any of that stuff either, right? Um, I, I think it's a, big, it's a big stretch to say that stuff. Um, so I, I do believe there's something. I don't believe, I don't believe it's a guy who wants to put you in hell for doing the wrong thing. What do you do if you feel like you're wasting your potential and fearing that your whole life will pass without you'll be able to produce something of value? 
Sometimes I feel like I have to work 24 seven to be able to achieve whatever it is that I'm dreaming of. And it makes me lose motivation a lot to see that there is no progress in the short term. So I get stuck in this loop. That is a common experience for a lot of people. And what I would recommend, uh, given these things that we've talked about today, is that when you're having this kind of feeling, so you say, you feel like you are wasting your potential and fearing that your whole life will pass without you being able to produce something of value. Okay, so these ideas about what you'll produce of value are speculations about what will happen in the future. And what often happens in the West is we put a great load on our shoulders about what will happen in the future. And that's functionally useful because it means we're a society about people who plan in the ahead and care about, you know, care about what will happen and all these things. Those things are good, but sometimes they become pathological. And so what you can do, you don't have control over what's going to happen in the future. You don't even know. Something world-changing could happen or... Uh, you know, some relationship in your life could change that changes your personal path through the world drastically, right? You don't know the future. What you do know is what's happening right now. So when you say you're fearing that your whole life might pass or you feel like you're wasting that, your potential, you can investigate those feelings and those thoughts in whatever particular moment you're in using the techniques we talked about today. And that will help. And you just, you just have to see. <laughs> Someone says, I think the difference for them is that one kind of tiredness is tiredness with a spinning brain, which constitutes depression, and the other is tired with a cloudy brain, which constitutes exhaustion. Maybe it's something like that, yeah. I mean, I think each individual person has to look and describe to themselves the difference, but there is a difference. Someone's asking a question that was already addressed about how much the success of my games lets me feel content. It's not really that connected, but I did answer that at length, so you can go back and look at the recording later. How do you observe nonverbal thoughts? Is awareness of your body a thought? I have trouble separating these things. I mean, you can get very picky about classifying. You can classify stuff into many different categories. Uh, when I say thoughts, I'm mostly thinking of either verbalizations in your mind, like I have some, you know, wispy, nonverbal construction of the linguistic form. I should have taken care of that box on the counter by now. Uh, that's one kind of thought. Another kind of thought might be a memory of something that happened, which is a little more visual, so it's a little bit less verbal, but it's still a pictorial representation in my mind. I'm throwing that together with the linguistic stuff. And uh, there might also be um, I, I mean, we can, we can start draw, parsing things into subtler and subtler departments but maybe that's maybe that's too much but like along with memories of the past there are expectations of the future right so I expect that tomorrow my, my lingering expectation that tomorrow somebody will pay me twenty dollars back that they owe me is like a thought even if it doesn't ever come in fully linguistically right it's an operation that my mind is performing with regard to the future. Um, so all of those things I'm categorizing as, categorizing as thoughts. Um, awareness of my body, I'm not categorizing as a thought. I'm saying that that's just awareness of a sensation, right? So fundamental awareness, like the fact that it's like something to be me and I see things and I feel things is not for the purposes of this discussion a thought that's prior to thought it's more fundamental but that that would be a whole other discussion that i don't necessarily want to go into someone's asking about standing or sitting desk but that's off topic enough that i won't go into it now um,
Is it a big problem that people don't see things as they are, but see things about the things? Like, I didn't care what he said, but more the fact that he even said it. Uh, maybe, but really what I'm getting at is that you're not really reacting to either of those things. You're reacting to some synthesis of yours that's about, that's at some meta level about those things. If that makes sense. Skipping off topic questions. Question, what's to stop you from using a kind of mindfulness inappropriately in situations where immediate action is required? It leads itself too readily to head in the sand kind of abuse. Well, okay. I have a little bit of a beef about that too. Let, let me talk about two kinds of mindfulness, right? There's a kind of mindfulness that grew up in the new age scene that is really about trying to feel good. And that's not what I am a proponent of. Uh, I think feeling good is nice, <laughs> but um, proper, proper, Proper use of mindfulness techniques are about knowing the truth. They're not about feeling good. So if you have an agenda of feeling good, all that can really do is lead you away from the right techniques or the best thing to do in the service of something that is maybe not as important. So, so when I talk about these kinds of techniques, even though I'm presenting them to you as a way of breaking apart chains of bad experiences and bad feelings, that's not necessarily in order to feel good. It's for you to see the truth about those bad feelings that they're not necessarily as bad as you might think they are. It's a distinction, it's a subtle difference. I'm gonna, for a second here, man, my, uh, my webcam is blurry. I wonder if I have it on blurry settings. So I'm going to take a second to tweak it. Camera control. Auto zoom will not turn on for some reason. It's just, oh, that's zoom. That's not focused. Uh, I got big for a second. Auto focus. We'll turn it on auto focus and see if it helps at all. Maybe that helped. No. Oh God, maybe that's way worse. Ah, autofocus. I need a better camera. I should have. I should have gotten a camera before doing this. Oh, and now the window won't pop up, so I'm unable. We're just stuck on autofocus now. I have to restart OBS to fix that. I know that from before. Do I trust in antidepressant drugs? I already. I gave a little rant about antidepressants. You can go back and look at that. Um, I make no recommendation pro or con them. I don't have enough experience with them to say anything about them. Do I tailor my present actions based on how I might feel in the future? For instance, future remorse. I call it pregret. Well, I think human beings do that. And I'm not sure it's a bad thing entirely. Like when people start getting into mindfulness and spiritual stuff, they tend to think it's bad to consider the future too much. But if we want to live pragmatically in the real world, consideration of the future is one of the things that we do. So for me, what it becomes is consideration of the future is more like a thing that I do a little bit hypothetically that I treat at a lower level of reality than what I can immediately observe. But that I do as part of getting my way through life. Like if I'm programming, I have to have some idea of what that program is gonna be in the future or I can't make it, right? You can't build something without an understanding of where it's going to go. So you, you have to have temporal planning, right? That's just a thing. Uh, and that can affect emotions as well as thoughts. And I think that's totally okay. As long as if it starts to become unhelpful or pathological, 
you know how to prevent the pathology, um, which for some people is easier said than done, which is why I'm sharing these ideas. Skipping more off-topic questions. Have I ever gotten to a point that I get so detached that getting back to normal, quote unquote, is jarring? How do you deal with that? Well, on occasion, yes, um, but that's usually to do with deeper meditation techniques and not these things. Um, but frankly, actually, it's never been that hard to come back to normal because we've done normal for most of our lives and we know what it's like and we're actually very well equipped to deal with normal because we've been practicing that for many years. So it's never been that hard for me. Have I heard about this Canadian psycho? Oh, that's off topic. Off topic. I considered talking about someone else's imposter syndrome question, but mentioned maybe circling back to it. This is me bringing it up if you want to know. Well, when it comes to imposter syndrome, how oh, this auto, I'm so glad I had autofocus off during the talk because this is, oh, it's going crazy. Um, I don't believe that most people who think they have imposter syndrome actually have imposter syndrome. I think that they are correctly diagnosing that they are a little bit imposters in the sense that they're not necessarily that good at the things that their field is about. So for example, if you call, talk about video game development, you know, which is what I work in, it's very, very complicated and hard and you couldn't be a master of it without working for decades, probably, unless you're some kind of amazing genius that the world has never seen yet. Um, so if you're only five or ten years into video game development, maybe you're right to feel some of these feelings. <laughs> maybe they're appropriate. Maybe you don't really know how to program that well. Maybe you don't really know how to design that well. Maybe you're not as good at organizing things as some of the other people. It's appropriate to feel that if it's true. So then I don't think the right response is to feel this like, oh, woe is me, I have imposter syndrome kind of thing uh, that people say on the internet. I think rather just come to grips with those feelings. Be like, yeah, it's not true that I'm as good at programming as I wish I were, so let me work on it and let me get better, right? Um, that's all. If you think you can go into a field where multi-decade expertise is necessary and, 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 good at it, and be good at it within a couple years, that's the delusion. Imposter syndrome is not the delusion. Thinking that you should be good after two years is the delusion. Thinking that you're not on some long trail of extensive skill building would be the delusion. That's what I have to say about it. It's kind of off topic, but the way it's on topic is that when you're feeling this imposter syndrome, you can use these techniques that I talked about today just to investigate it and see what it's like. How do I work with accusations of pretentiousness? It's been something that's been thrown around a lot in the context of my project, especially recently. Admittedly, in many cases, rather unfavorably and pejoratively, but I'm not sure how to tell if there's legitimately something of value to be taken from it as something to improve on, or if I should just dismiss it as a personal insult. Obviously, I don't try to be pretentious or pedantic and actively try to be sincere and, and the comment cut off there, but that's enough to talk about. So definitely, people have said that the things that I do are pretentious. I disagree um, in my own case. The observation that I make is that often that is coming from some kind of societal embarrassment to talk in a certain ways about certain things. Like, if you are too earnest or too obviously speaking about large topics that are supposed to be very meaningful, then people automatically label that pretentious because, hey man, you're not just being a regular bro or something, right? 
but it's really because they're maybe a little bit afraid or embarrassed to go there. Maybe not as an individual, but maybe even societally. And that's a problem because that feeds into nihilism, right? Maybe we end up in a place where as a society we're lacking meaning because we shoot down too many people who approach these subjects by saying they're pretentious. That said, you are certainly welcome if people say that you're being pretentious to actually introspect and honestly ask yourself, am I pretentious or not? Or am I sincere, right? If, if you, do you have an emotional reaction to being called pretentious? Do you have a physical body flushing that happens, right? Investigate those uh, because they're about something and you might learn something by investigating those. So do that um, and see what you find. And, and see if it leads you to any further understanding of your own work about whether it's really pretentious or not. I'm getting uh, a little tired now, so I think one or two more questions and then we're done. I'm just going to see in the order in which I scroll down, except, except my browser crashed. That's... Uh, that might be the end of the questions, guys. My browser is dead, so that's gonna be my excuse. I'm losing my voice a little bit. I need to work on speaking more relaxedly for longer periods of time. The autofocus is going crazy. So um, we're gonna use that uh, to mark the end of the thing. I'm sorry I can't see any more questions. Uh, thanks everybody for stopping by. And this will be up on YouTube if you missed some part of it. And we'll probably do another Q&A later on because I imagine people may have more questions. There are probably questions I didn't get to tonight, but also this is different from the sort of thing that I often talk about. So it seems likely <laughs> that people might have more questions. So maybe we'll do a Q&A tomorrow or in a couple days after people have had time to see the YouTube thing. Thank you everybody for stopping by and I'll see you later.